for their elders past and present. Just to let people know, tonight's lecture is being both audio and video recorded. Uh, that will be available on the Asian Law Centre's webpage, hopefully fairly soon. Uh, could I also ask you to remember to turn off your phones, uh, just so that that's not the as well. We are honoured tonight to hear from Dato and Bega Shunhasan, a distinguished Malaysian lawyer and democracy leader. Dato and Bega was born in Kuala Lumpur and completed her secondary education there before leaving for England, where she studied law at the University of Exeter and was called to the English Bar at Gray's Inn. She was then called to the Malaysian Bar and has now been in legal practice for close to 30 years. Dato and Bega commenced her legal career as a pupil in chambers at the leading law firm Kuala Lumpur, Shrine & Co., and rapidly rose to be a partner in that firm. Uh, very impressively, during the same time, she bore and parented two children, appeared regularly in court on complex commercial matters, and became increasingly involved in the work of both the Kuala Lumpur and Malaysian Bar Councils. She served on the Malaysian Bar Council from 2002 until 2010, and was elected Chair of the Bar Council and President of the Bar from March 2007 to March 2009. As an active member of the Kuala Lumpur Bar Committee and the Malaysian Bar Council, she was engaged in a whole range of writing of reports and research papers on various aspects of law reform, the state of the judiciary, the administration of justice, legal aid, and many pressing issues of human rights, notably Indigenous people's rights, religious freedom, and the rights of women. One could speak all night of her achievements in this role. Let me just highlight two. She was involved in convening an international panel of eminent persons to review the proceedings in 1998 of the two disciplinary tribunals that investigated the alleged misconduct of the then Lord President of the Supreme Court and five of his fellow judges. The report of the eminent persons was strongly critical of the disciplinary proceedings and defended the importance of judicial independence and the separation of powers. The panel of eminent persons report stands, I think, still as a significant model for other organisations that seek to establish their own independent panels to investigate abuses of power. She also led the Malaysian Bar and members of civil society in the historic Walk for Justice on the 26th of September 2007. Although Dato Ambiga and several members of the Bar were threatened with internment under the Internal Security Act, they were unfortunately not in fact detained. Rather, the government acceded to at least some of their requests and a Royal Commission of Inquiry was established to examine the state of the judiciary and judicial appointments uh, later on followed on the regular path as well. For these and similar achievements, Dato Omega has received several significant international awards, including the US Secretary of State International Women of Courage Award in, two, in 2009, an honorary Doctor of Laws from her alma mater at the University of Exeter earlier this year, and most recently was awarded the Knight of Legion of Honor from the government of France. However, extraordinary those, though those achievements are, it does not speak about them that she is here tonight. She is presently, Dada Amiga is presently head of the Civil Society Coalition, per se, the Coalition for Free and Fair Elections, a role which she remarkably combines with heading her own litigation firm and her ongoing human rights work. Perse has an eight point program to make Malaysian elections more democratic, transparent, and freer of money politics, and no doubt she'll speak more about that in a moment. In her role of chair, she has been involved in another historic street march on the 9th of July this year. This time, she was arrested, along with about 1,700 other Malaysians, many of whom also felt the effects of tear gas and water cannon. Her talk tonight, therefore, could not be more timely, nor could we have anyone um, better qualified to speak to us tonight about the significance of that, significance of that rally and its aftermath and the possibilities of fundamental democratic changes in Malaysia. We're delighted to have her here tonight, and I would ask you now to join with me in welcoming our speaker to the
By the way, I know that some of you were there in Kuala Lumpur walking. I know that some of you were there, were here in Melbourne walking. So um, I'd like to hear your stories later on after I tell you mine. Now, why a quest for democracy, you may ask? Doesn't Malaysia have elections every five years? Don't we have a written constitution, a bicameral legislature? Isn't Malaysia on the Human Rights Council? And you may ask, so why then did the Berse rally happen? Now let me start with our place on the Human Rights Council. You all know that we were on the Human Rights Council. That's very impressive, by the way. Let me tell you what we promised to do when we uh, applied for our candidature uh, to the Human Rights Council. In our letter, we spoke glowingly about how we would contribute towards enriching the quality of dialogue, cooperation and action aimed at advancing the promotion and protection of human rights for all people in all parts of the world. That was something we said in that letter. We then wrote, or in our pledge, we then wrote that since independence in 1957, our efforts to promote and protect human rights is reflected in our laws. We then cited the Federal Constitution, the Human Rights Commission Act, the Penal Code, the Child Act, the Persons with Disabilities Act and the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act as legislation which demonstrated our commitment to human rights. You will immediately notice that we left out the Internal Security Act, the Sedition Act, the Societies Act, etc., etc., etc. Now, we then add that at the national level, Malaysia is actively seeking to promote and protect human rights through efforts in various fields. And we say this, we said this, and I quote, racial unity and interaction has therefore formed a diverse and vibrant society that is exceptionally unique. I, unique, I agree with that. <laughs> then they go on to say, the three major races not only retain their respective cultures and traditions, but also maintain understanding and tolerance, as well as share each other's cultural richness. This cultural unity and diversity has given birth to peaceful coexistence and is the main catalyst for Malaysia's political stability and growth. So we know that. We know that is our strength. We know that is what we should be encouraging. And we know that that is what makes Malaysia special. We then pledge in this document, first, that we would increase, when I say we are talking about the government, that the government would increase support for the goals and functioning of SPACA, which is the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> we also pledge that there will be continuing efforts to raise human rights awareness among all segments of the population. And then we add, we will continue to foster meaningful and productive engagement between the government machinery and civil society. Per se is civil society, by the way. So that third commitment was we would continue to foster meaningful and productive engagement between the government machinery and civil society. So it underlines the importance of civil society in Malaysia. Now, if you go to the Human Rights Council website, you will see a few uh, frequently asked questions. It's quite interesting, you should go and have a look. And what they say, they say there is, for the first time ever, candidates gave voluntary commitments to promote and uphold human rights and will be expected to meet them or else, or else face possible suspension from the council. And then there is a question, could a member have its rights and privileges suspended in the council? The answer, the General Assembly has the right 
to suspend the rights and privileges of any council member that it decided has persistently committed gross and systematic violations of human rights during its term of membership. I'm sorry I spent a little bit of time on that, but it is a very, very important uh, background to what I'm going to say from now on. Now, so Malaysia is on the Human Rights Council. One would therefore be quite right to say that we should expect a higher standard in relation to human rights of Malaysia. We should hold them to a much higher standard. Now, SWARM, uh, and I don't know if you all have heard of SWARM, it's a human rights organization, it means the voice of the people. SWARM has, since 1998, it's a civil society organization, uh, since 1998, they have been publishing annual reports on the state of human rights in Malaysia. Now, those pledges that I read up to you that we had made for the Human Rights Council, we made in the year 2010. This is what Swaram said in the Human Rights Report for the year 2010. And I quote, the Malaysian government is directly responsible for a worsened human rights situation in 2010. Three women were killed under Sharia law for the first time in Malaysian history. Arrests under the Internal Security Act doubled and the scope of arbitrary detention broadened. The spike in deaths by police shooting reached alarming levels at some point to an unwritten shoot-to-kill policy where police shoot first and claim self-defense later. Other cases expose violence and torture by police, with some raising questions of point-blank executions. While excessive police force against protesters is nothing new, 2010 saw water cannons and tear gas turned on peaceful protesters, including children. They were not talking about per se then, they were talking about the year 2010. Nothing different happened in July uh, in relation to the protesters. And then they, they conclude, as the human rights situation in Malaysia continues to deteriorate, the government tops up its record at international forum. It is shocking that Malaysia was elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council on 13th May 2010 with its poor human rights record. 2010 is testimony to the fact that Malaysia does not deserve a place at the UNHRC table. So that was Swaram. Then, interestingly, we have the Prime Minister uh, when he was um, asked to comment about the Arab Spring. This is what he said, and this was February the 3rd, 2011. And this is what he said. Dr. Sri Nanji Raza called for an end to the bloodshed in Egypt and stressed the importance for its people to decide the future of their country. And then he adds, in a democratic system, we must prioritize the people. And that is why any solution in Egypt must be based on demands and wants of the people to determine the future of their government. And he also said, the regional uprising should be a lesson to world leaders, now hear this, that in the era of globalization, the voice of the people should not be ignored. But that was for Egypt. <laughs> now, these are just some of the things um, I wanted you to understand. What was happening in the year 2009, 2010, leading up to the rally. There was one more very significant event. These are not the only events, but these are key events. But a very significant event was in fact the Sarawak elections in April 2011. Now prior to the Sarawak elections, there had been four other by-elections. The Bursi was actually, um, had, we had meetings with the election commission. In fact, we had 
one senior meeting with the election commission and we were due to have another meeting. We then realized that a strong by-election, that a strong state elections so were going to be had in April 2011 and we made a decision. Let's see what happens in strong because that would give us an indication as to what will happen in the next general election. Well, I don't know whether any of you follow the job general elections, but we received reports of the worst cases of electoral fraud. You had abuse of power by civil servants and federal and state executives. So when they, for example, openly campaigned for their political parties, when they attended events in their official capacity. For example, the Deputy Defense Minister Abdullah Rahman reminded the army veterans in Zawa not to support the opposition. Then there was a report from a Kapitan, a Chinese community leader appointed by the state government, that government personnel from special branch, police or military would be stationed in long houses in the days running up to the election. Now, if you know Strava, uh, by the way, I've been banned from Strava. I did try to go in the day before the election, so I was banned. Um, and uh, what happened was, in, but I've been there before, and it is very easy to intimidate the people who live in the long houses in Strava. I can tell you, tell you there are many long houses in Strava in the interior who don't even have electricity and water. So if you give them money, it is not difficult to buy their vote. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. They are kept, in my view, in that state so that they are vulnerable to such gestures by the people in power. Contrast that with the Chief Minister of Strava who went to vote, cast his vote in a Rolls Royce. Now what contempt must he have for his people to do that when so many of them languish in long houses without basic uh, uh, necessities like water and electricity. So that was strong, that was not all. Then we even had, oh by the way the army was also used to intimidate constituents to vote for Barisa National. Then there were the I was banned, many other human rights activists were banned just before the elections. And um, of course they used uh, one of the tricks, I believe, these are the reports we get, is that the government will actually hire all the helicopters and other vehicles so that the um, opposition can't get their hands on it. Because uh, travel is, is a problem in Strava. You need to actually bring voters by various means because there are large uh, expenses, uh, there are rivers, and, and travel is very difficult. So, Strava so has got special features that makes cheating much, uh, much easier, I believe. Then, of course, there was out and out vote buying. We actually had video evidence of vote buying, where a trial mine Tamil, for example, spoke of BN representatives giving BN, meaning the government representatives, giving three checks amounting to ten thousand dollars, while heads of family and community were given fifty rupees each. And there was video evidence of that. And when we raised it, when Bursi said, why isn't the election commission investigating these offences, they said, we don't have the power. So they said, MACC should do it. So we said, well, why isn't MACC do it, doing it? Uh, and the response that we got on one of the reports was, uh, we cannot rely on video evidence. <laughs> Now you know how much video evidence goes on in Malaysia, right? <laughs> so that was a rather interesting response. So that was the Sarawak problem. And despite our meeting with the Election Commission, to us there was clearly no political will to change because the Election Commission did not believe that there was anything wrong with the elections. And therefore, once you have uh, you, you start with that premise, 
that the cost reform is impossible. So in June 2011, we announced that we would hold a public rally for free and fair elections. You know what our aid demands are. By all accounts, I was just speaking to Amanda earlier, electoral reform is a very, very boring subject. Um, and it shouldn't have drawn too much attention, certainly not the attention that it did draw. And it is attention that we were very surprised at. We don't know what stopped them, but they were spooked. The minute we announced the rally, non-stop from that day on, almost on a daily basis, they demonized per se. They demonized per se. First we were a Christian organization, then we were back by Jews, then we were, yeah, and, uh, and uh, all sorts of things. Uh. Then we got our money from foreign funders, then they threatened to, um, to uh, uh, investigate my accounts. They're still investigating, by the way. Uh, and they're investigating my accounts and so on and so forth. Then they threatened the ISA against all of us. Uh, ministers came out uh, again on a daily basis. Uh, several ministers came out. The Home Minister came out saying, we may use the ISA, we think we can use the ISA. Uh, then he came out and declared it's illegal. So you can see they tried everything. Death threats. There were death threats. Uh, then of course you had um, so, Sonia will be interested in this. The mainstream press, for goodness sakes, on a daily basis, again, I'm talking about the Straits Times, I'm talking about the Star, the mainstream press just carried on on a daily basis attacking Brasil and the members of Brasil. Of course, Utusan, well, <laughs> I guess my kids are Utusan, if you don't know what that paper is about. So, so they all went on a crusade against per se. And as I keep saying to someone, if you read the mainstream press and you read the online press, you would think you were in two different countries because honestly, they, they were, the mainstream press was busy demonizing, the on-stream press was giving fairer coverage. I mean, they were also critical of us sometimes, but it was much fairer coverage. So, and I credit to the, credit to the online media, Malaysia Key, Malaysian Insider, Free Malaysia Today, uh, um, MOB TV, Malaysian Observer TV, they all did a wonderful job. Not just reporting, the reporting running up to the Bursay Valley, but also on the day itself. Um, and I can tell you, Malaysian Southern reporters, the Rakyat were the best reporters, okay? Because on the 9th of July, if you, if you key in, uh, if you Google Bursay 2.0, 9th of July, the number of videos and I reports that will pop up will tell you what wonderful reporters our Rakyat are. Which is why when the IGP, in his infinite wisdom, came out and said that there were only 6,000 people there, he made a gross error. He should have worked out that there would be so many people filming, filming on that day, that it would be silly to come up with a figure like that. I think you could say there were 6,000 in half the street, perhaps, somewhere. But if you look at the numbers, they're pretty overwhelming. Now, so they uh, carried on the discussion. I can tell you personally, they, I, I got death threats and I was followed, my phone was tapped, uh, all sorts of things. And they tried everything in the book. And by the way, they also tried intimidation. Photographs were burnt, I think you know that. You also know that the Silat group, you know what the Silat group is, the, uh, self, the self defense group, with the Prime Minister. A few days before that, they came out and said, uh, yes, we are going to, they, they threatened to wage war against Bursa too, saying that they could not control their members' emotions if they were opposed. Right? This was backed by the Prime Minister. I can see some of you nodding because you remember, right? It's bringing back memories of what happened. Then, of course, the IGP also came out, thundering in the press. We are going to arrest anyone wearing t-shirts, yellow t-shirts, uh, connected with Brazil. I think you saw some of the most ridiculous reports of people just wearing yellow t-shirts and being arrested. That is a first for Malaysia. You really in Malaysia go there, okay? I think <laughs> Now, so, so there were t-shirts and he said, choose cars in use to encourage people to gather is seditious, said the IGP. So that was another threat. 
And he also said, based on our intelligence, if the valley is held, tension, chaos, destruction of property, injury, and even loss of life may occur. And um, then they arrested, and this was the unkindest cut of all. They arrested Dr. Michael Jayakumar, who is a member of parliament, who, for waging war against the king, by the way, this is really, you have to be archaic, they have to pick this one. For waging war against the king, six people were incarcerated under the emergency ordinance, that is an ordinance um, which provides for detention without trial. They didn't want to use the ISA, you see, because the ISA is bad press. They wanted to pretend that they were not going to use the ISA, so they used the ego. In fact, it's exactly the same kind of um, So, arrested kept them for more than 30 days. This is even after the Bursay rally, they didn't release them. They didn't release them until the pressure grew too much. And here again, it's credit to the people power. People were, uh, they had candlelight vigils on a daily basis. And the night before uh, the day they were released, we were going to have a massive rally in Dakar and Mareka and walk to Bukitaman police station. And Dr. Jeff Kumar started a fast. So I think they panicked and they released it.